That's horrible. That's horrible, Shannon. Great. Mm. Great rising. I'm going to have more there. Hey, little thing. All right, beautiful people. It is Tuesday, February the 2nd, 2021, day 67 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the privates. And of the three year consecutive day count, day 736. All right, y'all. So I'm already running a few minutes behind the day. So let's go ahead and um, start off here with the show so we can get through numbers. All right. All right, remember the Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter three. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse three. Trina, hey girl, hey Tiffany, peace and blessings, y'all. Okay. Here, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily, as Yahuwah, the God of our fathers, has promised us in the land that flows with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our God, remember, he's one God. And you shall love Yahuwah, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. And Yahuwah commanded us to do all these statutes to fear Yahuwah our God, for our good good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day and it shall be our righteousness if if we observe to do these commandments before you who are our God as he has commanded us okay let's see this here mm, all right move that down all right, y'all, we are in Numbers chapter four today. So let's go ahead and go over there. Okay. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, 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 Rebecca. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Miss Belinda Brown. Okay. All right, y'all. Numbers chapter four. Then Yahuwah said to Moses and Aaron, record the names of the members of the clans and families of the Kohathite division of the tribe of Levi. List all the men between the ages of 30 and 50 who are eligible to serve in the tabernacle. The duties of the Kohathites at the tabernacle will relate to the most sacred objects. When the camp moves, Aaron and his sons must enter into the tabernacle first to take down the inner curtain and the cover and cover the Ark of the Covenant with it. Then they must cover the inner curtains with fine goatskin leather and spread over that a single piece of blue cloth. Finally, they must put the carrying poles of the ark in place. Next, they must spread a blue cloth over the table where the bread of the presence is displayed. And on the cloth, they will place the bowls, ladles, jars, pitchers, and the special bread. They must spread a scarlet cloth over this and finally, a covering of fine goat skin leather on top of the scarlet cloth. Then they must insert the carrying poles into the table. Next, they must cover the lampstand with a blue cloth, along with its lamps, lamp snuffers, trays, and special jars of olive oil. They must cover the lampstand and its accessories with fine goat skin leather and place the bundle on a carrying frame. 
Next, they must spread a blue cloth over the gold incense altar and cover this cloth with fine goatskin leather. Then they must attach the carrying poles to the altar. They must take all the remaining furnishings of the sanctuary and wrap them in a blue cloth, cover them with fine goatskin leather, and place them on the carrying frame. They must remove the ashes from the altar for sacrifices and cover the altar with a purple cloth. All the altar utensils, fire pans, meat forks, shovels, basins, and all the containers must be placed on the cloth and a covering of fine goatskin leather must be sprayed over them. Finally, they must put the carrying poles in place. The camp will be ready to move when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the sacred articles. The Kohathites will come and carry these things to the next destination, but they must not touch the sacred objects or they will die. So these are the things from the tabernacle that the, Ke the Kohathites must carry. Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, will be responsible for the oil of the lampstand, the fragrant incense, the daily grain offering, and the anointing oil. In fact, Eleazar will be responsible for the entire tabernacle and everything in it, including the sanctuary and its furnishings. Then Yahuwah said to Moses, do not let the Kohathite clans be destroyed from among the Levites. This is what you must do so they will live and not die when they approach the most sacred objects. Aaron and his sons must always go in with them and assign a specific duty or load to each person. The Kohathites must never enter the sanctuary to look at the sacred objects for even a moment or they will die. And Yahuwah said to Moses, record the names of the members of the clans and families of the Gershonite division of the tribe of Levi. List all the men between the ages of 30 and 50 who are eligible to serve in the tabernacle. These Gershonite clans will be responsible for general service and carrying loads. They must each I'm sorry, they must carry the curtains of the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself with its coverings, the outer coverings of fine goat skin leather, and the curtain for the tabernacle entrance. They are also to carry the curtains for the courtyard walls that surround the tabernacle and altar, the curtain across the courtyard entrance, the ropes, and all the equipment related to their use. The Gershonites are responsible for these items. Aaron and his sons will direct the Gershonites regarding all their duties, whether it involves moving the equipment or doing other work, they must assign the Gershonites responsibility for the loads they are to carry. So these are the duties assigned to the Gershonite clans at the tabernacle. They will be directly responsible to Ithamar, the son of the priest. Now record the names of the members of the clans and the families of the Merorite division of the tribe of Levi. List all the men between the ages of 30 and 50 who are eligible to serve in a tabernacle. So these are the ages. Yahuwah makes a um he makes a point to always bring out the ages, those who serve, right? The men who, as they begin to be counted, it starts at age 20 on up, right? You can serve in war, you can help. Age 20, that's when you become responsible. And I think growing up, it it well, I guess in church lingo, it would be called the age of responsibility, right? Age 20. So you got some local head teenagers, 18, 19 years old. Be patient with them. Be patient with them. Who will cause them to account at age 20? Okay. But if you're going to serve in the presence of the most holy, you need a little bit more maturity on you. So you can only serve in the tabernacle if you have Levi between the ages of 30 and the ages of 50, right? Anything over 50, you can become like a lay person. You help around, help around, you know, help around the house, you know. But if you're over age 50, okay, your time is done. Go ahead and sit down, brother. Thank, thank you for your service, you know. And I think that should also, I think that that should carry along as well, I think, into the government. Like, even if you look at, like, the American government, Everybody over the age of 50, y'all gotta be done. Y'all gotta go. You know, that's 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 y'all gotta go. That's old blood and y'all doing the most damage up in there. Okay. A little low. Uh oh. I don't know, Trina. It's all the way up over here. There might be a phone. Check your phone. Okay. I'm sorry. 
Let's just kind of move y'all over here then. I don't know. Maybe that might work. Okay. So Moses, Aaron, and the other leaders of the community listed the members of the Kohathite division by their clans and families. The list included all the men between 30 and 50 years of age who were eligible for service in the tabernacle, and the total number came to 2,750. So this was a total of all those from the Kohathite clans who were eligible to serve at the tabernacle. Moses and Aaron listed them just as Yahuwah had commanded through Moses. And I think, like, if you got a church too, clearly, if y'all over 50, y'all just go ahead and sit to the side. I think even the deacons board, all of them is clearly over the age of 50, but it shouldn't be that way, people. If you're going to have church, set it up right. Okay. The Gershonite division, who was also listed by its clans and families, the list included all the men between 30 and 50 years of age who were eligible for service in the tabernacle. That's twabble, but twabble, TT. And the total number came to 2,630. So this was a total of all those from the Gershonite clans who were eligible to serve at the tabernacle. Moses and Aaron listed them just as Yahuwah had commanded. The Merorite division was also listed by its clans and families. The list included all the men between 30 and 50 years of age who were eligible for service in the tabernacle. And the total number came to 3,200. So this was the total of all those from the Merorite clans who were eligible for service. Moses and Aaron listed them just as Yahuwah had commanded through Moses. So Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of Israel listed all the Levites by their clans and families, all men between 30 and 50 years of age who were eligible for service in the tabernacle and for its transportation, numbered 8,580. When their names were recorded, as Yahuwah had commanded through Moses, each man was assigned his task and told what to carry. And so the registration was complete, just as Yahuwah had commanded Moses. All right, y'all, we're moving on to Numbers. Chapter 5, Purity in Israel's Camp. Yahuwah gave these instructions to Moses. Command the people of Israel to remove from the camp anyone who has a skin disease or discharge or who has become ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person. This command applies to men and women alike. Remove them so that they will not defile the camp in which I live among them. So the Israelites did as Yahuwah had commanded Moses and remove such people from the camp. Y'all got to go to quarantine. I'm sorry. These are the rules. Peace. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see you in a few days. Then Yahuwah said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, men or women, betray Yahuwah by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. See what he said? Yahuwah said, you betray him. His people betray him when they betray other people. Read it again, just in case you were not paying attention up to this point. Then who will say to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, men or women, betray Yahuwah by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. They must confess their sin and make full restitution for what they have done, adding an additional 20% and returning it to the person who was wrong. So you don't just get, get to say, I'm sorry. Forgive me and go on about your business. Whatever it was, you didn't just destroy it, tore up, uh, tried to return in a fashion that it was not given to you. You will say you wrong. He said, not only do you need to say sorry, but you need to restore what it was you didn't just tore up that they gave to you in good condition. Matter of fact, add 20% on it. And if they out of the model and the make or whatever it was that you didn't destroy, you need to upgrade them and give it to them, right? That's how you appropriately apologize, by restoring what you didn't tore up. You don't just get to say, sorry, forgive me. Bless you and go on about your business. Boy, whoo, you gonna catch you, you gonna catch these hands. <laughs> but if the person who was wrong is dead 
and there are no near relatives to whom restitution can be made. The payments belong to Yahuwah and must be given to the priest. Those who are guilty must also bring a ram as a sacrifice, and they will be purified and made right with Yahuwah. All the sacred offerings that the Israelites bring to a priest will belong to him. Each priest may keep all the sacred donations that he receives. And Yahuwah said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Ooh, I forgot about this part was coming up. Pay attention, women. Although y'all may not, uh, y'all may not be doing this. Um, and they may not be going to the priest to figure out, hey, is this really going on? But I tell you, Yahuwah is faithful in all that he does every day, yesterday, today, and forever. Listen to this. Because he will, he, you could just go to Yahuwah and ask him, hey, listen, okay. And Yahuwah said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Suppose a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband and has sex with another man, but neither her husband nor anyone else knows about it. She has defiled herself, even though there was no witness and she was not caught in the act. If her husband, I mean, she did it and she thought she got away with it, right? Nobody else saw itself for her, the person she committed adultery with. And the most important person who you not had anything from is the most holy. The most holy saw it, right? You know, so Yahuwah's kind of, he, he's serious about keeping covenants, right? Listen, and this would apply for a man and a woman, mind you. Try it. Although they, although they may not drink this mixture, you can simply go ask the Most Holy and he'll reveal the truth because it's his desire that he saves covenant relationships, right? You can screw up and not say you purposely, but even if you purposely do, right? And you are truly repentant. Yahuwah is in the business of restoration, right? He will restore the relationship if both parties agree they want it to work, right? Natasha, hey girl, hey. Okay, I started over. And Yahuwah said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Suppose a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband and has sex with another man, but neither her husband nor anyone else knows about it. She has defiled herself even though there was no witness and she was not caught in the act. If her husband becomes jealous and is suspicious of his wife and needs to know whether or not she has defiled herself, the husband must bring the wife to the priest. He must bring his wife to the priest. He must also bring an offering of two quarts of barley flour to be presented on her behalf. Do not mix it with olive oil or frankincense because it is a jealous offering. Excuse me. It is it is a jealousy offering. An offering to prove whether or not she is guilty. Then the priest will present her to stand trial before Yahuwah. He must take some holy water in a clay jar and pour it into the dust he has taken from the tabernacle floor. When the priest has presented the woman before Yahuwah, he must unbind her hair and place in her hands the offering of proof, the jealousy offering to determine whether her husband's suspicions are justified. Now, you know, this ain't going to work unless Yahuwah himself um, is behind all this, right? I'm glad to see you safe, Natasha. The priest will then put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has had sex with you and you have not gone astray and defiled yourself while under your husband's authority, may you be immune from the effects of this bitter water that brings on the curse. But if you have gone astray by being unfaithful to your husband and have defiled yourself by having sex with another man, at this point, the priest must put the woman under oath by saying, may the people know that Yahuwah's curse is upon you when he makes you infertile, causing your womb to shrivel and your abdomen to swell. Now this water, now may this water that brings the curse into your body and cause your abdomen to swell and your womb to shrivel. And the woman will be required to say, yes, let it be so. 
And the priest will write these curses on a piece of leather and wash them off into bitter water. He will make the woman drink the bitter water that brings on the curse. When the water enters her body, it will cause bitter suffering if she is guilty. The priest will take the jealousy offering from the woman's hand, lift it up before Yahuwah and carry it to the altar. He will take a handful of flour as a token portion and burn it on the altar. And he will, he will require the woman to drink the water. If she has defiled herself by being unfaithful to her husband, the water that brings on a curse will cause bitter suffering. Her abdomen will swell and her womb will shrink and her name will become a curse among her people. But if she has not defiled herself and is pure, she will be unharmed and will be still able to have children. This is the ritual law for dealing with suspicion. If a woman goes astray and defiles herself while under her husband's authority, or if a man becomes jealous and is suspicious that his wife has been unfaithful, the husband must present his wife before Yahuwah, and the priest will apply this entire ritual law to her. The husband will be innocent of any guilt in this manner, but his wife will be held accountable for her sin. Now, I have seen this happen to where although there wasn't a priest available and there wasn't a dredge to drink, right, um, a simple prayer would suffice to the most holy, right? Like you can pray like if you really and I see I've, I've seen it happen with both parties, whether the wife thinks the husband is guilty or whether the wife thinks the husband is guilty. You know, and in some versions, I believe it's the KJV, it says it will cause her thigh to rot, right? You're going to be stanking, right? But I've, from some personal um, things shared with me, right? Um, it has happened to where if, uh, <laughs> it, it's crazy, y'all. You can just pray and ask the most holy and he will cause something to happen to verify yay or nay. Like I've seen it happen. Well, one party after prayers prayed, one party will get hemorrhoids in their buttocks. I'm like, what? What happened now? What? You know, um, and it, it, it's it, it's something to happen in that area <laughs> where, you, like, if a prayer is prayed, like something will happen in that area if that person is guilty, right? That, that's just from things shared with me from different people who who were suspicious and couldn't necessarily prove it but it was it, it it was like they they had to really be suspicious and they had like really had to be something like going on where they really had to know but I, I've seen it happen that way on both parties now what's been done from that point that's between that party and the most holy whether y'all decide, okay, yep, sin has taken place. We need to repent or I can't deal with this anymore. We need to part ways, right? And what happens after that point? Because you're, you're asking for information that it, a decision is going to need to happen once this information is revealed. Now, if you're not good at taking information and good at taking truth, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. Then you might just need to stop asking questions. But <laughs> if you must know, you know, you have to understand that if you who reveals truth to you, there's a decision that must happen, right? Either, okay, either we're going to repent, we're going to have you who will restore the marriage, or we're going to, you know, we're going to have to part ways, especially if you're going to be in that relationship and somebody, you pick, I mean, you can't ask for information and be pissed and continue to, I mean, you can be upset. I mean, it, you, you've broken the covenant, right? Um, but something has to be done. You can't just boom, we got it from you. You you can't know that there's a thief in your house and just be content with walking around now knowing that the thief is in your house. Like you can't, hey thief, yeah, I got some money under the mattress too. You, I mean, you can't just, it's impossible to be the same without dealing with the issue, right? The issue must be dealt with, right? So if you bring in the most holy to help you and he reveals to you that, yes, this is true. Like, I mean, it, it clear, something clearly happens with that person, with that area. Right. It's crazy. It's crazy. Right. I'm like, you got you. What happened now? You know, so but 
I mean, a, a decision must be made, right? If you, like I say, you, you just can't continue to walk along. The problem must be it. It must be dealt with in one form or another, right? Okay. Uh, last chapter for the day, number chapter six. And guys, here is where the blessing comes from. It's the last a few verses of this chapter, but remember how I always say the first 21 verses is the Nazarite vow. Well, I know I've read it before too, and I'll give you a quick summation sometimes, but now we're going to fully read through the Nazarite vow. Okay. Then you who have said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any other people, either men or women, take the special vow of a Nazarite setting themselves apart to you who are in a special way, they must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine or other, or from other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice and they must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from the grapevine not even grape seeds or skins. And I will also say grape seed oil if you cook with it, right? Shalom, Michael. They must never cut their hair through the time of their vow, for they are holy and set apart to Yahuwah. Until the time of their vow has been fulfilled, they must let their hair grow long. They must not go near a dead body during the in entire period of their vow to Yahuwah. Even if the dead person is their own father, mother, brother, or sister, they must not defile themselves. For the hair on their head is the symbol of their separation to Yahuwah. This is a requirement as long as they are set apart to Yahuwah. If someone dead, if someone falls dead beside them, the hair they have dedicated will be defiled. They must wait for seven days and then shave their heads. Then they will be cleansed from their defilement. On the eighth day, they must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to present to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. The for one of the birds for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. In this way, he will purify them. Then they in this way, he will purify them from the guilt they incurred through contact with the dead body. Then they must reaffirm their commitment and let their hair begin to grow again. The days of their vow that were completed before their defilement no longer count. They must rededicate themselves for the full term of their vow. They must eat a lamb for a guilt offering. So say you decided to set yourself apart for seven years. Halfway through your vow, or let's just say three years into your vow, like, boom, somebody passes, right? And you have been defiled. You know what happens? You got to start all over. You who said those days no longer count because you have been defiled. You got to start it all over. Start afresh. Cut it off. Let's begin again, right? And we need to pray that nobody passes this time through this um, this vow, especially because you made such a long one, right? And I, I look at it like this. If, bless the most holy, he'll, he'll keep that which belongs to us, right? Uh, he said, I keep those who keep my commands. But if that happens to happen and you take the vow, a lot of times, even if you're that far into your vow, a lot of times those who are really searching after the most high and really love him, it even if they was like six years into their vow and something happened, they wouldn't even mind starting it all over, adding another six years, <laughs> you know, doing those whole six years over again, right? Okay. All right, that's just my thoughts. That, that's my, not, that's from personal experience, I know. This is the ritual law for the Nazarites. At the conclusion of their time of separation as Nazarites, 
They must each go to the entrance of the tabernacle and offer their sacrifices to Yahuwah, a one-year-old male lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a one-year-old female lamb without defect for a, without defect for a sin offering, a ram without defect for a peace offering, a basket of bread made without yeast, cakes of choice, flour mixed with olive oil, and wafers spread with olive oil, along with their prescribed grain offerings and liquid offerings. The priest will present these offerings before Yahuwah, first the sin offering and a burnt offering, then the ram for a peace offering, along with the basket of bread made without yeast. The priest must also present the prescribed grain offering and liquid offering to Yahuwah. Then the Nazarites will shave their heads at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then they will take the hair that has been shaven and dedicated and place it on the fire beneath the peace offering sacrifice. After the Nazarite's head has been shaved, the priest will take for each of them the boiled shoulder of the ram, and he will take from the basket a cake and a wafer made without yeast. He will put them all into the Nazarite's hands, and the priest will lift them up as a special offering before Yahuwah. These are holy portions for the priest, along with the breast of the special offering and the thigh of the sacred offering that are lifted up before Yahuwah. After this ceremony, the Nazarites may drink wine again. This is the ritual law for the Nazarites who vow to bring these offerings to Yahuwah. They may also bring additional offerings if they can afford it, and they must be careful to do whatever they vow when they set themselves apart as Nazarites. Then Yahuwah said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. May Yahuwah bless you and protect you. May Yahuwah smile on you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah show you his favor and give you his peace. Whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people of Israel in my name, I myself will bless them. All right, beautiful people. So that was Numbers 4, 5, and 6. Now let's hop on over here to the Legends of the Jews and pick up where we left off at yesterday, page 275. For those who have the smaller book, it's volume three, and the section is called Moses Chosen as Intermediator. All right, y'all, let's, let's, let's get it going. Joanne, shalom, shalom. Okay. After Israel had heard the Ten Commandments, they supposed that Yahuwah would on this occasion reveal to them all the rest of the Torah. But the awful vision on Mount Sinai, where they heard the visible and saw the audible, the privilege was granted them that even the slave woman among them saw more than the greatest prophet of, late, of later times. This vision has so exhausted them that they would surely have perished had they heard another word from Yahuwah. They therefore went to Moses and implored him to be the intermediator between them and Yahuwah. Yahuwah found their wish right, so that he not only employed Moses as his intermediator, but he determined in all future times to send prophets to Israel as messengers of his words, right? So that's why we have the prophets. We didn't originally have them because Yahuwah would be speaking to us himself, right? So because of all this and they died and he had to resurrect all of them. He said, see, this is why the, the flesh can't take my magnificence. So this is why we're going to use Moses. Right. And the people say, oh, Moses, you go talk to him. We love him. Oh, he is the most holy. But when we hear his voice, we die. We, we don't want to do that anymore. We want to stay alive for as long as we can. So you go talk to him, seeing that you can go like in and out of his presence, right? Like Moses was kept safe. Like then it dawned on them that this, this could happen. You just got to you gotta do what Moses did to be able to get what Moses got, right? That's self-explanatory. Yahuwah found their wish right so that he not only employed Moses as his intermediator, but Yahuwah in all future times but determined in all future times to send prophets to Israel as messengers of his words. Turn to Moses, Yahuwah said, all they have spoken is good. If it were possible, I would even now dismiss the angel of death, but death against humanity has already been decreed by me. Hence, it must remain. Go, say unto them, return to your tents, but stay thou with me. In these words, Yahuwah indicated to Israel 
that they might again enter upon conjugal relations from which they had abstained, abstained from throughout three days while Moses should forever have to deny himself of all earthly indulgences. Yeah, There's not a lot of people that, that, that even want to think about doing that, right? People, they, they, they like to please this too much, right? Mm, well, most we can't do what you do. You just go ahead and speak for us. We go, let us know what you get, bro. <laughs> I'm just like, mm. Moses in his great wisdom knew how, in a few words, to calm the great excitement of the myriads of and saying to them, Yahuwah gave you Tor, gave you the Torah and wrought marvels for you in order through this and through the observances of the laws which he imposed upon you to distinguish you before all the other nations on the earth. Consider how that whereas up to this time ye have been ignorant and your ignorance served as your excuse. Now you know ex exactly what to do and what not to do. Until now, you did not know that the righteous are to be rewarded and the godless to be punished in the future world, but now you know it. But as long as you will have a feeling of shame, you will not lightly commit sins. Hereupon, the people withdrew 12 miles from Mount Sinai, while Moses stepped clo quite close before Yahuwah. In the, in, in the immediate proximity of Yahuwah are the souls of the pious. <clears throat> a little farther, mercy and justice, and close at and close to these was the position Moses was allowed to occupy. The vision of Moses, owing to his nearness to Yahuwah, was clear and distinct, unlike that of the other prophets who saw but dimly. He is furthermore distinguished from all the other prophets that he was conscious of his prophetic revelations while they were unconscious in the moments of prophecy. So you ever had a prophecy, you heard a prophet prophesy, right? And somebody may come to them later and um, say, hey, remember, remember you came here a few years ago and you prophesied to me that I would have a baby, you know, something like that, right? And the prophet is looking like, I know I came here a few years ago. I don't, I'm sorry, sister. I don't, I don't remember, you know, or, some it is it, that's what they're talking about when you when prophets are truly prophesying and Yahuwah is truly speaking to them, it completely bypasses them, right? And it goes directly to the person, and the person most of the time does not remember, you know, um, what is being prophesied to that person, right? He is furthermore distinguished from all the other prophets that he was conscious of his prophetic revelations while they were unconscious while they were unconscious in the moments of prophecy a third distinction of Moses which he indeed shared with Aaron and Samuel was that Yahuwah revealed himself to him in a pillar of a cloud in spite of these great marks of favor to Moses the people still perceived the difference between the first two commandments, which they heard directly from Yahuwah, and those that they learned through Moses' intercession. But when they heard the words, I am the eternal, thy Lord, the understanding of the Torah became deep-rooted in their hearts so that they never forgot what they thus learned. But they sometimes forgot the things Moses taught. But as a man is a being of flesh and blood and hence ephemeral, so are his teachings ephemeral. Here, they hereupon came to Moses saying, oh, if he would only reveal himself once more. Oh, that once more he would kiss us with the kisses of his mouth. Oh, that the understanding of the when he will put his law in their inward parts and write them in their hearts. Oh, boom. And that's how we know, guys, this also is another source of contention, but you read it all through scripture, right? You hear about people teaching what Yahuwah says this new covenant is, right? From the church, you hear something totally separate from what Yahuwah says his new covenant would be, right? They teach you something else. They I'm, I don't, I'm not going to get into it, but if you hear, you know what it is. But if we go back to what Yahuwah has said that the new covenant would be, we would need to stop 
who need to pause and think about it. Okay, so you who said the new covenant was going to be this, but y'all are teaching us that the new covenant is this. It doesn't line up. Who do we believe? We always believe the authority, right? Let's go, let's go back to the principle of first mention. And who first mentioned it? Yahuwah first mentioned it, right? It's his law. He said, this is what's going to happen. And if you don't know what it says, let me just sum it up for you real quick. And then when we get off here, you can go and check through the books of the prophets and see you who are saying this. Um, you can find it. You can find it. <laughs> just Google. Matter of fact, Google. I will put my law in their inward parts. That's what you can Google, right? And it'll take you right to the couple if it comes up in Google. Well, it will when it comes up in Google, it'll give you the couple of places where it's listed. So this is what Yahuwah said his new covenant would be, right? He said, Y'all gonna get the same covenant, the same thing that your ancestors got. Not one thing from it is gonna disappear. You're gonna get the same exact covenant. The only thing different is this time I'm not gonna give it to you on two tablets. This time. I'm going to inscribe it on your hearts so you can remember it, right? You're never going to forget it. And you're going to love it. And you're going to love me. And I'm going to be your God. And you're going to be my people, right? That's what he said it is. That's what he always said it was. That's what it always will be. Go check that out. Verify it. You hear anything else? It's a lie, right? And so we know that this right here by us returning to him it's beginning the process. We're beginning to return to what he said alone. And we're beginning to keep these commands. And we're beginning to love them. And they're becoming a part of us, right? Okay. Oh, that once more he would kiss us with the kisses of his mouth. Oh, that understanding of the Torah might remain firm in our hearts as before. Moses answered, it is no longer possible now, but it will come to pass in the future world when he will put his law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Israel had no other reason for regretting the choice of an intermediator between themselves and Yahuwah. When they heard the second commandment, thou shalt have no strange gods beside me, the evil impulse was torn from out of their hearts. But as soon as they requested Moses to intercede for them, the evil impulse set in once more in its old place. In vain, however, did they plead with Moses to restore the former direct communication between them and with Yahuwah so that the evil impulse might be taken from them. For he said, it is no longer possible now, but in the future world, he will take it out of your flesh. He will take out of your flesh the stony heart. Although Israel had now heard only the first two commandments directly from Yahuwah, still the divine apparition had an enormous influence upon this generation. Never in the course of their lives was any physical impurity heard among them, nor did any vermin succeed in infesting their bodies. And when they died, and when they died their corpses remained free from worms and insects. Let's go to the next section. Moses and the angels strive for the Torah. The day on which Yahuwah revealed himself on Mount Sinai was twice as long as ordinary days. For on that day, the sun did not set a miracle that was four times more repeated for Moses' sake. When this long day had drawn to its close, Moses ascended the holy mountain where he spent a week to rid himself of all mortal impurity so that he might betake himself to Yahuwah into heaven. At the end of his preparations, Yahuwah, Yahuwah called him to come to him. Then a cloud appeared and lay down before him, but he knew not whether to ride upon it or merely to hold fast to it. Then suddenly the mouth of the cloud flew open. He entered into it and walked into the firmament as a man walks about on the earth. Then he met, it's, it's like a transportation portal. I'm like, oh, Father, can you do that? Like, mm, Moses was gone like 40 days, but I can't be gone like 40. I mean, I guess I could be gone 40 days. You could cause time to stand still, but you know, I got all these kids, you know, husband, he can get suspicious. Like if I'm gone, he's going to think I done ran out and did something. I won't want that. Okay. So can we do this like at night while everybody sleep? You just get me, take me to heaven during the nighttime hours. We can chat all night. You can restore me, give me all the strength I'm going to need so I can just wake right up and go on about my day. Like, can we do like these same things, but just kind of like take me at night? 
<laughs> but then maybe that every night because, you know, I'm married, but, you know, we got to work something out. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Seriously, I'd be having these type of conversations. I, I really do. I, I don't know about y'all, but I really do. I'd be thinking about some of these things. I was like, oh, snap. So when Moses went up on the mountain, he wasn't literally just sitting up there on the mountain. It, it was covered from everybody else, but there was a portal that transported him to heaven. He went on up. All right, Moses sitting up there on the mountain. He doing his prayer and stuff. But all this time, Moses like, all right, let's go. You know, and so he was transporting all this time. He was in heaven. I'm like, oh, snap. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Then suddenly the mouth of the cloud flew open and he entered into it and walked about in a firmament as a man walks about on the earth. Then he met Camuel, the porter, the angel who is in charge of 12,000 angels of destructions who are posted at the portals of the firmament. He spoke harshly to Moses saying, what dost thou hear, son of Amram, on this spot belonging to the angels of fire? Moses answered, not of my own impulse do I come here but with the permission of the Holy One to receive the Torah and bear it down to Israel. As Kimuel did not want to let him pass, Moses struck him and destroyed him out of the world, whereupon he went on his way until the angel Hadarniel came along. This angel is 60 myriads of parasangs taller than his fellows, and at every word that passes out of his mouth issue 12,000 fiery lightning flashes. When he beheld Moses, he roared at him, what dost thou hear, son of Amram, here on the spot of the holy and high? When Moses heard his voice, he grew exceedingly frightened. His eyes shed tears, and soon he would have fallen from the cloud, but instantly the pity of Yahuwah, for Moses was awakened, and he said to hard Nari, hard Hardarniel, you angels have been quarrelsome since the day I've created you. Y'all remember when we read this a while ago? You angels have been quarrelsome since the day I created you. In the beginning, when I wanted to create Adam, you raised complaints before me and said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And my wrath was kindled against you. And I burnt scores of you with my little finger. Now again, ye commence strife with the faithful one of my house whom I have bidden to come up here to receive the Torah and carry it down to my chosen children, Israel. Although you know that if Israel did not receive the Torah, you would no longer be permitted to dwell in heaven. When Hardar Neil heard this, he quickly said to Yahuwah, O Lord of the world, it is manifest and clear to thee that I was not aware he came hither with thy permission. But since now I know it, I will be his messenger and go before him as a disciple before his master. Boom. Right now. Think about something. Why? Think about what he just said. He said, I was not aware that he came here with your permission. Almost holy. Right. So what have we learned? There are some people who have kind of made it through to where there are watch standards on polls asking him. What are you doing here on the place of the holy and high? Like, how did you get here? Because we read early in the beginning. Remember when um, the angels who uh, left their post to have sex with the human women? Remember one of the human women, it, we heard the story. One of the human women, well, when the angel wanted to have sex with her, she was like, well, teach me the ineffable name of the most holy, right? And so as soon as he taught her the name, well, she said, you teach me the name of the most holy. You give me what I want. I give you what you want. So the angel decided to teach her how to pronounce the ineffable name of the most holy. As soon as she learned how to pronounce it, she pronounced his name and shot right up to heaven. We understand that by the ineffable name is how the angels ascend and descend from heaven, right? So their angels stand and watch just in case by some chance you happen to learn how to pronounce the ineffable name of the most holy, which carries all the power, right? So when we see through scripture and by this name shall all people be saved, if we understand what it was talking about by this name, we're talking about Yahuwah's name. It's by this name shall all men be saved. Not another name, by Yahuwah's name only, right? And not only is it, oh yes, you're going to save my soul. No, when they pronounce the ineffable name of the most holy, they were saved in every sense of the word. They could have been in danger 
Right, we're going to see as we keep on reading, all they had to do was pronounce the ineffable name. When Moses pronounced the ineffable name, the sea clave for him. All the miracles that happened, whether he used the rod, because remember, it tells us that the ineffable name of the most holy was engraved upon that staff that Moses had. Yahuwah's name was engraved on the staff, so all he had to do was to lift his hand or to, to strike the rock or whatever it was, touch you with it, the ineffable name on it carried the same amount of power as if when you would speak it or when you would read it, right? It, 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 it's that much power. If your life is in danger, that much power by speaking that name, it grabs the attention of all of heaven directed to you and it saves you out of whatever situation you are currently in. You could be dangling. Matter of fact, somebody was dangling from a tree not absalom absalom was dangling from a tree that he matter of fact he got held up in the oak tree by his hair that's how he got slaughtered but there was somebody else king david also when he was in a war but we're going to get to all of that and they were these people about to lose their life when they pronounce the ineffable name of the most holy right so this name is powerful so when we hear that when we understand this y'all got to think about this because Yahuwah is going to restore all of this to us right in the time to come, he's going to restore to us his his ineffable name, right? He's just going to give it to people that's going to use it willy-nilly, right? Like, I think you got to go through this. I don't know. You, you got to be proven because you just can't give something precious to vagabonds. Otherwise, they're going to misuse it. Like, there are people on the that use, like, dark magic and stuff, like, and, and they know the ineffable name of the most holy. And I said, well, Yahuwah has purposes for everything and all that I don't quite understand, right? So even some of them using it for evil purposes or whatever, and I'm sure they don't get all the power simply because the intents of their heart and Yahuwah is directly behind everything. They don't, they, they, they use it in, in the way that literally it, it, it eventually ends up taking their life, right? When it was meant to give us life, those who misuse it, it takes their life. Right. Okay. I just wanted to say that. Okay. But we're going to get to it. We're going to see that. Okay. In the beginning, when I wanted to create Adam, you raised complaint before me and said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And my wrath was kindled against you. And I burnt scores of you with my little finger. Now again, he commits strife with my faithful one, with the faithful one of my house, whom I have bidden to come up here to receive the Torah and carry it down to my chosen children of Israel. Although you know that if Israel did not receive the Torah, you would no longer be permitted to dwell in heaven. When Hadar, Hadar and Neil heard this, he quickly responded to Yahuwah, O Lord of the world, it is manifest and clear to thee that I was not aware he came thither with thy permission. But since I know now, I will be his messenger and go before him as a disciple before his master. Hadarniah hereupon in a humble attitude ran before Moses as a disciple before his master until he reached the fire of Sandalphon. When he spoke to Moses saying, go turn about for I may not stay in this spot or the fire of Sandalphon will scorch me. This angel towers above his fellows by so great height that it will take 500 years to cross over it. He stands behind the divine throne and binds garlands for his Lord. Sandalphon does not know the, the abiding spot of Yahuwah either so that he might set the crown on his head, but he charms the crown so that it rises of its own accord until it reposes on the head of Yahuwah. As soon as Sandalphon bids the crown rise, the host on high tremble and shake. The holy animals burst into peons and the holy seraphim roar like lions saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When the crown has reached the throne of glory, the wheels of the throne are instantly set in motion. The foundations of its footstool tremble and all the heavens are seized with trembling and horror. As soon as the crown now passes the throne of glory to settle upon its place, all the heavenly hosts open their mouths saying, praise be the eternal from his place. 
And when the crown has reached its destination, all the holy animals, the seraphim, the wheels of the throne and the host on high, the cherubim and the hashmalim speak with one accord. The eternal is king. The eternal was king. The eternal will be king in all eternity. Now, when Moses beheld Sandalphon, he was frightened and in his alarm came near to falling out of the cloud. In tears, he imploringly begged Yahuwah for mercy and he was answered. In his bountiful love for Israel, he himself descended from the throne of his glory and stood before Moses until he had passed the flames of Sandalphon. After Moses had passed Sandalphon, he ran across Rigion, the stream of fire, the coals of which burn the angels who dip into them every morning are burned and then arise anew. This stream with the coals of fire is generated beneath the throne of glory out of the perspiration, out of the holy Hayat, who perspire fire out of fear of Yahuwah. However, Yahuwah, however, quickly drew Moses past Rigion without his suffering any injury. As he passed on, he met the angel Galizer, who is also called Raziel. He, it is, who reveals the teachings to his maker and makes known in the world what is decreed by, by Yahuwah. So remember, all the way in the beginning, we learned about this angel Raziel, right? And it is a book called the Book of Raziel. But it, it's not a book about him. It's the charge that Yahuwah has given this particular angel to reveal to the sons of men on earth what is to happen in their days and in future generations, right? There's all type of wisdom found in this book, right? Y'all should look for it. And if you're ready for it, Yahuwah let you find it. Yeah, but it ain't for everybody. There are some people, hold on. Mm, and I, mm, without getting off too much, I'm telling you, those who get it will understand the wisdom in it because Yahuwah will allow them to understand. Those who are not to have it but find it in their possession cannot understand it. I'm telling y'all that from personal experience. That's why I'm not telling y'all to go because y'all may not be ready for it. And it's like, wait, what is this? What is this talking about? Like, what? Like, and I've even, from where I got it from, I've read some people, they was like, don't even waste your money on this. And I'm like, oh, how could you say that? I have that. I know what's in there. I know some precious things that are in there. There are some things that I prayed and I practiced that I, like, I put into my prayer. I'm like, it works. What are you talking about? Like, so that's when I understood that some things are closed to some people, like, you and I could both carry the same book. And I, just like it's, it's, it's like the same principle with the Bible, y'all. Two people can hold the same exact Bible and can get two complete different interpretations. One could be true. One could be error. And some person will get it and they it just looks like a bunch of gibberish to them. I don't understand. Well, I, I'm going to quit saying it. I know it's Yahuwah. It's Yahuwah. We read it yesterday. You know, there are different things we get from our father. And there are certain things that we get from my mother and the other things like spirit and understanding breath comes directly from Yahuwah. So if you can't understand it, Yahuwah has not given it to you to understand and you can't be pissed about that. Yes. Thank you, Michael. It has to be given by Yahuwah. And that's when I stop kind of arguing with people. I won't respond to some comments and stuff because now I understand you don't understand because Yahuwah is not allowing you to understand. Now, that's kind of sharp, but I understand the truth of the matter. If you don't understand, not saying you won't understand or understand it won't be given to you. But at this point, you don't understand because understanding is not given to you by the most holy. What else can I say? What else can I say? Like, thank you, mom. You must be ready and Yahuwah will make you ready. And that's something I hear my uncle say a lot. When a student is ready, the teacher will appear, right? So when you are ready for something, what you are ready for begins to appear before you. When the student or when the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear, right? So understanding may come for you in future days. It really may. You know, um, it really may, especially those who love the most holy. But you may not be ready for 
it yet. Have y'all, ooh, great interjection. Any of y'all that like Marvel movies, have y'all seen, and I'm sure y'all have, have y'all watched the movie Doctor Strange? I love that movie. I love that movie. I'm going to use a good, good example, right? Listen. Okay. So I hope y'all get this analogy. Okay. So you know when the doctor, he went to go, he went to Tibet and everything, and then he found the master, found out um, the master he was like, well, all this stuff, what are you talking about? All this stuff that we read and in, in, in like the hospital store in the book or whatever, it's the same thing. He said, I read what, what, um, mm, mm. oh my gosh, it's slipping my tongue. But anyway, if y'all haven't seen it, go watch it and you'll get what I'm talking about. But anyway, he, she asked him, she said, well, you ever heard about this? He said, oh, yeah, I see them little pamphlets, them books in the hospital, you know, gift store. You know, what are you talking about? That's a bunch of, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's a book, like. What are you talking about? And she just looked at him. And it was then that I understand, like, now that I understand this, I understand what was happening, right? Wisdom is laid everywhere. But if you're not ready for it, it looks like something common to you. and it, You will pass by it. You won't get the understanding from it. You could have literally the, the wealth of the world sitting in a book or, or whatever it is. But if you're not ready for it, for one, you're not going to recognize it. Two, you're not going to understand it. Even if you picked it up by mistake or somebody gave it to you, you're going to flip through like, uh-huh, yeah, mm, yeah, okay. And it's going to go sit on your shelf somewhere. You possibly may even give it away because you don't understand because you're not ready for it. Yahuwah is the one who gives understanding, nobody else. Okay, so what happened was, there was the, the, the master teacher, right? So she had pupils. This they was away, they was at this place, and they were praying and learning how to do different things, how to manipulate the elements. And then they um there was like uh 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 white my what they didn't say white magic, but they called it something else. And it's been a while, I'm getting the terms, but anyway, just for the sake of it, there was like good powers and bad powers, right? And so, but the teacher was teaching them that these things exist, right? They both exist, what we would deem good and what we would deem bad. But it's not good or bad in itself. It's the intent behind it when it's being used because it's simply tools, right? It's like a pen and that's the principle she was explaining, right? And that's what I understood. And that's what I understand now. So you have something. This pen was designed. This pen is neither good nor bad in itself, but it depends on who is the user of this pen. Now, I could pick up this pen and use it for what it was intended for. And I can write letters and I can write beautiful love songs. I can even write apologies. I can draw beautiful pictures and do all these things. I can do some beautiful things with this pen. But let somebody with evil motives and evil intentions get a hold of this pen. Oh, you piss me off. Oh, I'm going to kill you. It's the person who holds the tool and their intentions behind it that's either going to produce good in the world or they're going to produce bad in the world. And they can take that same, that very same pen that I just had and change the world with, they can take it and they can destroy the world. They can create music and songs that are going to tear you down. They can uh, write stories that are going to be indelibly, indelibly, um, indelibly imprinted on your mind that will never leave you, right? They could take that same thing and write uh, disgusting movies and porn and stuff that defiles people. They can even take this same pen and they can stab somebody in the hand or in the heart. They can literally kill somebody physically, uh, mentally, spiritually, in every sense of the fashion. They can take the same pen and they can destroy a person with the same thing that bought somebody life. They have now taken it and brought death into the world, right? It's according to your heart and your mind. So that was the principle that was being taught in the movie Doctor Strange, right? So she has students. There were some who they were set on posts and they were set in different nations of the world through the different portals and stuff. And they were there to kind of like be guardians and protect the different tools or magic or whatever you want to call it. Like, um, but there were also some vagabond students like, oh, well, we want to be, we want to be the master. And they're taking these same tools and now they're causing destruction to happen. They're using it and creating dark magic in the world. Right. And so what happened was towards the beginning when this happened, 
there was one of the students who didn't quite understand it. And they saw the master appear and saw the master use the dark magic in order to bring everything back into complete um into complete balance where they her students had taken the same dark magic and they caused chaos and everything was going out of control and she showed up because she understood how to manipulate the elements understand that there are tools but she had to use it to bring it all back into balance and there was a student that she had who didn't understand truly what this was and why she had to do that and he said to her you tell us all this time to stay away from the dark magic, yet I find you using it. I was like, oh, he don't understand. He didn't realize. And, and she had to explain to him that it's it's neither good nor bad. It's the person who's using it. Like you said, according to your mind and your heart, the intentions on what they wanted to take this and use this for. She said, but this is simply principles. I'm simply taking these <clears throat> elements and bringing them back into their proper place so balance can remain so goodness can be here for all right because Yahuwah says i create good and i create evil but there's a perfect balance of it to create keep a harmony so to speak which keeps self-destruction from happening right same thing in your body you got good bacteria you got bad bacteria in here right the bad bacteria is only found in a certain portion of our body in order to kind of keep the flora and all that stuff going on down like in the rectal system but it's there there's a perfect balance of it if you get too much it'll cause you to have um it'll cause you to have issues going on in your rectal system or whatever, but there's also a good bacteria there that help balances, balance it out, right? But if you don't have enough of that, it, it still throws things out of whack. So there's a perfect balance for, and some places may need more of it than others to keep things in a perfect balance, but it keeps it in a perfect balance, right? So that was the whole point of bringing that up. And we got on that when we was talking about this angel Razia, and there's actually you can find portions of that manuscript out here, right? So, and like I said, uh, I've come across a couple people. They're like, "How are you? How are you getting all this from that?" I'm like, "I like I read it and I just see it. what do you mean. Then you you read the same words? No, what are you talking about? This is I think I completely wasted my money on this book, and I'm just like, and I just got quiet. I'm like, oh, it is the most holy who truly gives understanding. Okay. Let me go back up. So that was enough of that, y'all. So, but if y'all haven't seen that, go go watch that movie, Doctor Strange. You will understand exactly what I'm talking about because that principle is there. As he passed on, he met the angel Galizer, also called Raziel. He it is who reveals the teachings to his maker. He it is who reveals the teachings to his maker, <clears throat> and makes known in the world what is decreed by God. <clears throat> Excuse me. For he stands behind the curtains that are drawn before the throne of Yahuwah and sees and hears everything. Elijah on Horeb hears that which Raziel calls down into the world and passes his knowledge on. This angel performs other functions in heaven. He stands before the throne with outspread wings and in this way arrests the breath of the Hayat the heat of which would otherwise scorch all the angels. He furthermore puts the coals of Rigion into a glowing brazier, which he holds up to kings, lords, and princes, and from which their faces receive a radiance that makes men fear them. When Moses beheld him, he trembled, but Yahuwah let him pass unhurt. Then came a host of angels of terror that surround the throne of glory, and they are the strongest and mightiest among the angels. These now wish to scorch Moses with their fiery breath. But Yahuwah spread his radiance of splendor over Moses and said to him, Hold on tight to the throne of my glory and answer them. For as soon as the angels became aware of Moses in heaven, they said to Yahuwah, Who does he who was born of a woman doing here? And Yahuwah answered as follows, he has come to receive the Torah. They furthermore said, O oh Lord, content thyself with the celestial beings and let them have the Torah. What wouldest thou with the dwellers of the dust? Like he said, give it to us, the celestial beings. Why would you give it to sons of the dirt? Moses hereupon answered the angels. It is written in the Torah. I am the eternal. 
thy Lord that have led thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Were ye perchance enslaved in Egypt and then being delivered that ye are now in need of the Torah? It is further now written in the Torah, thou shalt have no other gods. Are there perchance idolaters among ye that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, thou shalt not utter the name of the eternal thy God in vain. Are ye there perchance business are there perchance business negotiations among ye that ye are in need of the Torah to teach you the proper form of invocation? It is written, remember to keep the Sabbath holy. Is there perchance any work among you that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, honor thy father and thy mother. Have ye perchance parents that ye are in need of the Torah? Is it written? It is written, thou shalt not kill. Are there perchance murderers among ye that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. Are there perchance women among ye that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, thou shalt not steal. Is there perchance money in heaven that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Is there perchance any false witness among ye that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, covet not the house of thy neighbor. Are there perchance houses, fields, or vineyards among ye that ye are in need of the Torah? The angels hereupon relinquish their opposition to the delivering of the Torah into the hands of Israel and acknowledge that Yahuwah was right to reveal it to mankind, saying, Eternal, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory upon the heavens, who has set thy glory upon the heavens. Moses now stayed 40 days in heaven to learn the Torah from Yahuwah, but when he started to descend and beheld the host of the angels of terror, angels of trembling, angels of quaking, and angels of horror, then through his fear, he forgot all he learned. For this reason, Yahuwah called the angel Yephiah, Yephiah, the prince of the Torah, who handed over to Moses the Torah, ordered in all things and sure. All the angels, too, became his friends, and each bestowed upon him a remedy as well as the secret of the holy names as they are contained in the Torah and as they are applied. Even the angel of death gave him a remedy against death. The applications of the holy names, which the angels through Yephiah, the prince of the Torah, and Metatron, the prince of the face. Y'all remember who Metatron is, right? The prince of the face, the angel of the face. Who is that? That's none other, none other than our great brother Enoch, whom Yahuwah took. And translated him. Now we read the entire book of Enoch and what happened. And uh, Jasher gives you a little bit about what happened with Enoch before he was just taken. While West canonized, I only give you about two sentences about him, who his parents were, and how he pleased the Most Holy so much that he just took him, right? But the book of Enoch and um, also the book of Remembrance. Uh, what else did we read, y'all? Something else gives you all the details. And even in here, it gives you a couple different sections about what actually happened during Enoch's days and what he did and how he ruled as king for a very long time before Yahuwah took him. Matter of fact, Enoch was in a habit of meeting with the most whole, like what was happening here with Moses. The same thing was happening with Enoch. He would spend time in Yahuwah's presence and Yahuwah said, go back and teach the people. Teach them my words. Teach them. This is what was happening, right? So this is so cool. If you never read that, if you weren't here while we were reading it, y'all have to read it, right? Okay. All the other angels, too, became his friends, and each bestowed upon him a remedy, as well as the secret of the holy names, as they are contained in the Torah, and as they are applied. Even the angel of death gave him a remedy against death. The application of the holy names, which the angels through Yephiah, the prince of the Torah, and Metatron, the prince of the face, taught him. Moses passed on to the high priest Eleazar, who passed them on to his son Phineas, also known as Elijah. And we're going to stop right there for today. Um, 
I was about to say something else about that. Oh, listen. Maybe I shouldn't say it. Well, though those who can't get it just won't get it, right? Okay, so I noticed, I think I will put it in here, and maybe in my other one. Um, I've noticed over the years by learning different things, and at first when you who was waking me up, how you know you like you see um the Jewish people they talk about like this cold that's like within the Torah. There truly is a cold within the Torah, right? Now that I I, I don't understand it fully but i um hold on Did I, I may have put it in my other one i know i put it in a at in the um in the like the comment section of a couple of videos but the ineffable name of yahuwah it can be found it's encoded in the book of exodus I want to say is chapter 14, verses 19 through 21. Exodus 14, 19 through 21 is where in those scriptures, the ineffable name of Yahuwah is encoded within those words. Now, how you pull out, how you decipher the code is directly given by Yahuwah himself where that name can be used appropriately, right? I just want to say that. But not a lot of people be able to use it. Okay. So, and I'll put that, I'll put it in the um in the chat box so you can see. You can actually go and read what that says. And if you're so inclined to pray and ask the most holy about that and how his name is inscribed in this particular set of scriptures and how it is deciphered, and if he reveals it to you and gives you understanding then blessed be he. You know, you're ready for it. But if not, give it some time. You still need to get ready. Okay. So I hope y'all enjoyed the reading for today. It is February the 2nd, 2021, day 67 of year three of reading through the books of the law and prophets. And of the three-year consecutive day count, day 736. We read numbers four, five, and six. And we read Legends of the Jews, page 275 to page 277. All right, y'all. And while Moses is receiving it tomorrow, that's what we're going to pick it up tomorrow, which says Moses receives the Torah. So it's 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 a whole lot of good parts left for y'all. So it's just getting better day by day. All right, y'all. So with that being said, let's go ahead and do the lesson so we can get out here, get out of here and get about our day today. How did I come into the knowledge of that coding? Yahuwah? It's the only way I can say that. It's like, seriously, I, I just begin to kind of like understand some things, right? And so I have I have other things that Yahuwah kind of gives to me that I, I don't really share up here, right? Um, so I, I let's just say it, it's Yahuwah how I came into the knowledge of that coding, Uncle Nathaniel. Okay. I mean, that's the best way I can say that, right? Me, if y'all know me, like when I find something or I come upon something, I'm I'm like, okay, Father, you will say, test me. So I'm like, okay, let's test these principles. I was like, okay, Father, make sure I'm reading scripture. Okay, so, all right, I'm going to just, and and I I test things by simply going to Yahuwah and praying and asking, or I'll read the portion of scripture. Father, I don't really understand how this is decoded or encoded or whatever. You know, if you want to reveal it to me or you just want to show me the results, I'm fine either way. A lot of time, I just see the results. Like, I don't get the formula. I, I can't even, even, I don't, I can't tell you what the formula is, right? It's just like a car. I can't tell you how they're put together. I mean, I just, you know, just from watching videos, but I can't tell you the information that the mechanic or the designer of that knows and how they put it together so perfectly. I just get the keys and get in and go. I follow the directions. This is a, listen, you don't need to know the formula, how it's built or how it works. This is the only thing you need to do. Take the keys, put it in ignition, start it up, and go like I've, I've I've got the keys. I've learned how to drive it. Now I do know in order to maintain this, I just can't drive it forever. There are some things that I need to do personally. Like I need to make sure I get proper maintenance on. It. I make, need to make sure I need to get the oil changes, put gas in it. Right, those things in order to keep this 
principle that I'm driving and moving around in and work in order and having it work for me the way it was designed to. I didn't need to know all the inner workings. That is just, that's that's how I look at it. I don't really need to know all the inner workings. You can reveal it to me if you want to, but I'm simply, I'm just going to apply this with prayer. Okay, Father, you know, if you want to reveal the, the details of how this works, the formula and stuff, you can. Um, Not that I'm asking for it. I just want to know if it works. So <laughs> I just need to see some results. So I'm like, and I'm cool with the results, but some things, there are some things that I want the math on. There, I really do want the scientific math on some things. Like one thing that I really do, and that's what is something I stick with. Y'all hear me talk about it all the time, the clock in the sky. I really, truly want the details of how that works, right? That's something out of everything else. I just show me, give me the formula to the formula that I need, not the formula for creation and design. And just give me the formula to work it appropriately. That's all I need for these. But for this, I want the instructions. Like I want the scientific formula. Or, and I want to say, and I don't know. I'm drawn to that. Um, it really interests me to keep my attention where to other people sound like blah, 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 blah. What you say, girl? I meet you down the street. Okay. All right. You know what all that? It's just like how the genealogies and the numerology sounds of people. And thus we got so and so and thus we got so and so and thus we got so and so and thus we got so and so. Ooh, and she had a lion that came down the street. You know, it's it's like that. It's, people get lost. They most people are not, they I meet you when the story pick back up, right? You know, so that, that's the only way I can that's the only way I can say how I came into the knowledge of the coding, right? Now I don't know the the like I said, the inner workings of how that scripture works and how his name is encoded in there. I kind of sort of understand how it is. Okay, so in the Bible, like whatever language is translated into English, right? But if you go back to the original Hebrew and you understand how the Hebrew works and how it's read in the opposite direction, and how like I could get I could get into some of those details on how it's encoded in there to where you'd be able to actually pull the name out of this, but it's strategically hidden in here. Just, ooh, ooh, perfect. Listen, we grew up doing this. So I know this principle to be true. Listen, I don't know how it works, but I know it works. If we, like my mom taught us this, it, it, I, we grew up knowing the principles, but not really understanding this is what we were using. If we feel like, uh, if we felt like a demon spirit or something was released in the house or some crazy is happening in the house or, oh my gosh, I think I just saw a black figure in the corner or something or whatever, what mama say do? Bust out that anointing oil and read the 91st Psalm. That's what we're doing. So we grew up doing that. But what I began to notice is like, and even though I don't necessarily use the anointing oil so much, but I understand there's something about the 91st Psalm that drives away fear and darkness. Whatever is encoded in that Psalm, even when you read it in the English language, it radiates in the atmosphere. I can't exactly tell you how, but there's something encoded where it's been, even though it's been translated to English, it, it still works. It still works. Also, when I used to have, think, oh, here's another one. People who have problems sleeping. You pick up the Bible and you read it. You may not pick it up because you got a problem with sleep. And maybe it's like, oh, I probably need to read the Bible more. But when you read it, you tend to um, fall asleep, right? There's there's a piece encoded and the words that you can't see, but it's it's there, if that makes sense, y'all. Yeah, it, the peace of Yah that transcends all understanding. It, it, we may not be able to see the formula, but if we would just use it, just pick up the keys, get in the car and go, it works. It does what it was designed to do. The, the maker of this has designed it so much that we don't even need to really understand how it works. This is all I need you to, I've, I've made this foolproof for you. All you got to do, I've, every, everything, I said everything in motion already and it's going to stay in place. Here's all you need to do. Just take the key, get in it and go. You only may need to put gas in to make sure you get proper maintenance. But if you do these things, my laws will hold up, right? It's like the Torah. 
do these things. If you do these things, my laws will hold up. Like he keeps those who keeps his commands. It's the same principle all the way through it. Like we, if we don't worship other gods and only worship him, we continue to see that goodness in our lives and in our family, right? And he is sickness, all, all these things Yahuwah said he will keep from among us and he will keep us fertile and everything. It, you see what I'm saying? It's like the same principle. It's like when you see it, you can't unsee it. And then you can see it everywhere, you know? So, but just to answer your question, I know I just gave you a whole bunch and you just asked me one simple question. How did you come into the knowledge of that coding? I'm just going to say you who and through my experiences and things he takes me through, like you will, will use because I can see him in everything. He can show me himself in everything, like even on my kids and even a movie, just how I use the analogy in the movie and Dr. Strange and, and different experiences going through my life. I tend to be able now to start seeing principles and laws working behind them. Even like we talked about the other day, the airplane, it's overriding principles that have been set in motion. Why? Because you know of a higher principle that will supersede this principle that if you violate this principle, this principle will kill you, right? You cannot violate the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. And if you go up high enough and if you hit the ground hard enough, you will die, right? Great catastrophe. But if we find another law that works in conjunction with this law, we can supersede this law and we can continue to go and we can go higher and we can understand certain things. But some people, even in their spiritual walk, they can't get past the bottom levels. So they can't even begin to understand the higher laws, which supersede these laws, where if you people down here see these laws, oh, you're doing magic and witchcraft. What, what are you talking about? These laws are there, but you can't see them because you can't see the basic stuff. Okay, y'all don't get me started today. I'm sorry. That's it. Let's go ahead and do the blessing, y'all. But that's it. That's it. Ah, that I I can only say it was the most holy, right? That's it. That, that's that's how. But I put the scripture in there, um, in Exodus where his name is encoded, and you can read it, like, cause I'll read it. I'm like, Father, if you actually want to reveal the name, that's cool too. But I'm going to just I'm going to just say this, this scripture portion. Right. You know, because I know the ineffable name is encoded here. So and that's all I got to say about that right now. For right now. For right now. OK, y'all. The blessing is found. Y'all know in Numbers chapter six, verses 22 through 27, because we just read that. That was the last chapter we read. Remember the first 21 verses is the Nazarite vow. And you who spake unto Moses saying, speak unto Aaron and unto his son saying, on this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel saying unto them, may you who will bless us and keep us. May you who will make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May you who will lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. That's it for today. I ain't got nothing else. We had an hour and 26 minutes. So I will see y'all bright and early in the morning, 7 15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If I am running a few minutes behind, if I have to do something, something in the morning, a lot of times I can post that on Facebook, but I can't make posts on YouTube because I post up. We'll start at 7 25 or whatever. Because sometimes last minute stuff come in here in the morning for the business. So it's like, ah, oh, we need to send it now. So I had to do that real quick and then I'll hop right on. But YouTube, y'all just kind of waiting like, okay, is she coming on? So if it's one of those moments, um, just know it's probably something like that. Just just, just hold off for a couple minutes. We're coming. We're coming. If it's not the Sabbath, we're going to be here. Because remember, we rest on the Sabbath days. <laughs> Uncle Nathaniel, you know I'm going to call you just as soon as you're off this, right? And I know it, man. <laughs> okay, y'all. I know you're I know you about to call me. I know it. I know you are. <laughs> All right, y'all. I see y'all in the morning. Peace.